Joining us now with his plan to fix it, independent presidential candidate RFK Jr. Thanks for having me, Steve. It's great to have you. When you see something like that, you know, back in the day, it used to be hard to get in the country. And if they did get in the country, there'd be a Border Patrol person there saying, hey, stop. Uh, or you got to turn around. Now, can you explain what Joe Biden's doing? I can't explain the rationale. And I've been down to the border. I, I spent uh, three days in Yuma watching this. And I was astonished. I, you know, between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. in the morning, I watched 300 people just walk across the border. There were buses that were bringing them up to the border that were owned by the Mexican drug cartel, mm -hmm. uh, 100 or 55 people in a bus. And I watched the first 110 people that came over were from West Africa. And I wasn't able to interview them. But then the second two buses that came in, I was able to interview all the people. and. Only two of them had asylum claims. Most of them were from Asia. Right. And um, it's really, it's astonishing that, the, you know, the Border Patrol is utterly demoralized. You could stop this very quickly. And there doesn't seem to be any interest yeah. in the Biden administration doing it. Last month, Steve, the, we hit a record of 247,000 um, migrants arrested, which means many more were coming across. Right. So, uh, and you know, it's not sustainable. Our country, we've already absorbed 7 million right. people in the last three years. And it, the, the, uh, the pilot, whatever they're thinking is, is wrong. It's insane. If you were elected president, how would you fix it? I would stop it overnight. There, you know, I've talked to the patrol. I've talked to law enforcement. Um, what we we need to do is to, to complete the 27 gaps in the in the wall. You don't need a wall from Brownsville, Texas, 2,200 miles to San Diego, but you need the physical barrier in those highly populated zones where uh, migrants can disappear very quickly. So there's 27 big gaps where everybody's coming through. In the rural areas, you need to restore the fences that were torn up right. by, the, by the administration. You need to put in the long-range cameras, the lights, the sensor equipment, and then you need, we need asylum judges on the border to adjudicate the cases there. And we need to reinstate the Migrant Protection Act that requires people with asylum claims to remain in Mexico while all those right. claims are adjudicated. And that would stop the flow immediately. Yeah. And that's what you would do if elected president. Of course, you're running as an independent. And right now, when you look at uh, the very latest Gallup poll, when uh, people across the country are asked, how do you self-identify politically? Look at this. Uh, I, the number of independents has gone way up. I, I see uh, a Quinnipiac poll with independents. You are beating Joe Biden and uh, Donald Trump. In battleground states, uh, you beat Donald Trump and Joe Biden with young voters. Uh, the Harvard-Harris poll, you beat Donald Trump and uh, Joe Biden in favorability. So right now you got the wind at your back running as an independent. But, you know, you come from one of the most famous Democratic families in the world. Is the two-party system broken? It's definitely broken. And I think more and more people are seeing how corrupt it is. And the corruption is increasing. You know, there was a um, Bernie Sanders, some of Bernie Sanders' followers uh, sued the Democratic Party a couple of years after 2016 in federal court. Right. And the, for fixing the, the vote against Bernie. And the federal judge said, yeah, it is against their own rules. They broke, they violated their own rules, but they are a club and they're allowed to do that. Mm. And that ruling gave the party, empowered the party with permission, because before that, they were at least pretending to, uh, uh, to be neutral in elections and to not fix the outcome. And now they have no restraints. And you've got, you know, all this corporate money pouring into them, you know, from these big from military contractors, from the pharmaceutical right. companies, and, uh, and, and both parties are receiving the money from the same groups. And 
it's fixed against the American, it's rigged against the American public. Of course, uh, the system is such that you've got to get ballot access on all 50 states. Uh, yeah. We're just about out of time for the segment. Are you going to be able to do that? Yeah, we will be in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. All right. Bobby Kennedy Jr., great to have you. Thank you very much. Steven, for thanks for having me back. Kennedy24.com. <laughs> All right. In just a couple of hours, House Republicans in Congress are expected to begin marking up articles of impeachment against Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. The border surge growing by the day, as seen in this exclusive video. Watch these migrants crossing the United States. All they're going to do, they're going to walk around part of the border wall right there, and then they're going to go past a little uh, razor wire. And that wasn't too tough. Here they are in the United States. Well, our next guest has seen the crisis at our border firsthand. Join us now with his plan to fix it, independent presidential candidate RFK Jr. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for having me, Steve. It's great to have you. When you see something like that, you know, back in the day, it used to be hard to get in the country. And if they did get in the country, there'd be a Border Patrol person there saying, hey, stop, uh, or you got to turn around. Now, can you explain what Joe Biden's doing? I can't explain the rationale, and I've been down to the border. I, I spent uh, three days in Yuma watching this, and I was astonished. I, you know, between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. in the morning, I watched 300 people just walk across the border. There were buses that were bringing them up to the border that were owned by the Mexican drug cartel, mm -hmm. uh, 100 or 55 people in a bus, and I watched the first. 110 people that came over were from West Africa. And I wasn't able to interview them. But then the second two buses that came in, I was able to interview all the people. And only two of them had asylum claims. Most of them were from Asia. Right. And um, it's really, it's astonishing that, the, you know, the Border Patrol is utterly demoralized. You could stop this very quickly. And there doesn't seem to be any interest yeah. in the Biden administration doing it. Last month, Steve, the, we hit a record of 247,000 um, migrants arrested, which means many more were coming across. Right. So, uh, and you know, it's not sustainable. Our country, we've already absorbed 7 million right. people in the last three years. And it, the, the, uh, the pilot, whatever they're thinking is, is wrong. It's insane. If you were elected president, how would you fix it? I would stop it overnight. There, you know, I've talked to the patrol. I've talked to law enforcement. Um, what we we need to do is to, to complete the 27 gaps in the in the wall. You don't need a wall from Brownsville, Texas, 2,200 miles to San Diego, but you need the physical barrier in those highly populated zones with. Uh, Migrants can disappear very quickly. So there's 27 big gaps where everybody's coming through. In the rural areas, you need to restore the fences that were torn up right. by, the, by the administration. You need to put in the long-range cameras, the lights, the sensor equipment. And then you need, we need asylum judges on the border to adjudicate the cases there. And we need to reinstate the Migrant Protection Act that requires people with asylum claims to remain in Mexico while all those right. claims are adjudicated. And that would stop the flow immediately. Yeah. And that's what you would do if elected president. Of course, you're running as an independent. And right now, when you look at uh, the very latest Gallup poll, when uh, people across the country are asked, how do you self-identify politically? Look at this. Uh, I, the number of independents has gone way up. I, I see uh, a Quinnipiac poll with independents. You are beating Joe Biden and uh, Donald Trump. In battleground states, uh, you beat Donald Trump and Joe Biden with young voters. Uh, the Harvard-Harris poll, you beat Donald Trump and uh, Joe Biden in favorability. So right now you got the wind at your back running as an independent. But, you know, you come from one of the most famous Democratic families in the world. Is the two-party system broken? It's definitely broken. And I think more and more people are seeing how corrupt it is. And the corruption is increasing. You know, there was a... Um, Bernie Sanders, some of Bernie Sanders' followers uh, sued the Democratic Party a couple of years after 2016 in federal court. Right. And the, for fixing the 
the vote against Bernie. And the federal judge said, yeah, it is against their own rules. They, broke, they violated their own rules, but they are a club and they're allowed to do that. Mm. And that ruling gave the party, empowered the party with permission, because before that they were at least pretending to, uh, uh, to be neutral in elections and to not fix the outcome. And now they have no restraints. And you've got, you know, all this corporate money pouring into them, you know, from these big from military contractors, from the pharmaceutical right. companies, and, uh, and, and both parties are receiving the money from the same groups. And it's fixed against the American, it's rigged against the American public. Of course, uh, the system is such that you've got to get ballot access on all 50 states. Uh, yeah. We're just about out of time for this segment. Are you going to be able to do that? Yeah, we will be in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. All right. Bobby Kennedy Jr., great to have you. Thank you very much. Stephen, thanks for having me back. Kennedy24.com if people want to help us get on the ballot. Look at that. <laughs> Wait until the very end for the good plug. All right. I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilmeade. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. May 13th, 1951, three-term congressman walks in for a dinner party and meets a uh, freelance photographer. And that's where JFK, Bobby's uncle, met Bobby's aunt, which is Jackie. And that happened here. And Georgetown is, is famously haunted with, with, wonderfully haunted with uh, great memories of stuff. And I, I know for a fact that your aunt and uncle will be so proud of you being here tonight. So let's hear it for you. It's fantastic. Is here, my buddy oh, yeah. from uh, Michigan. We were uh, dorm mates in Alice Lloyd at Michigan. Uh, is the guy who introduced me to Bobby Kenny years ago at a, a book signing party at his place in New York City. And uh, and then I immediately got on board when Bobby decided to run for president for a number of things. Uh, we were at your announcement at the Park Plaza, where ironically I was there last night. Priscilla's with me. And uh, you said a couple things that really resonated with me. And you invoked your uncle, you invoked your dad, uh, specifically with your dad. Uh, you, you, I'm paraphrasing, but you said that he would take you on vacations to places like the Dakotas, and you would vacation with Native Americans. And your dad would say, these are Kennedy people, they need your help. And that, was, that really s stuck with me. I thought that was fantastic. And so there was that. And then, you know, you have a wonderful way about you with that kind of stuff. And I just think you're gonna make a fantastic president. So, so thrilled to have you here. Uh, before you talk, I'm gonna introduce my buddy, Tony, and uh, then we're gonna hear from you. So, fantastic. Everybody, thank you all so much for coming here. Let's hear from Tony Lyons. Yeah, hey, come on in. the CEO of Skyhorse Publishing. And take away, buddy. Hi, yeah, I'm Tony Lyons. I'm the co-founder of the Super PAC American Values 2024, and we're throwing this party tonight. Thank you all for coming. I've known Bobby Kennedy for more than 10 years. I'm his publisher and his friend, and I have just great respect for him. And, you know, I really think that we haven't had a president who's had the kind of authenticity and integrity and character that Bobby Kennedy has in decades and it's time that we have that once again. So I'd like to say a poem that I know Bobby likes. Uh, it's called The Second Coming by William Butler Yeats uh, in honor of Bobby's 70th birthday. So the poem is turning and turning in the widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming, hardly are those words out, when a vast image out of the spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man is moving its slow thighs whilst all around us move uh, real shadows of the indignant desert birds.
the darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle, and what rough beast his hour come round at last slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. So I was thinking about that poem and I was thinking, you know, the best lack all conviction, the worst are full of passionate intensity. And I think, you know, Bobby doesn't lack conviction. Bobby has great conviction and, you know, great steadiness and sincerity. And he has real passionate intense, you know, in, intention and intensity. And there's, you know, no other reason why he wants to be president other than to make this country a better place, to make this country the kind of country that we all here want it to be and that we know that it can be. So I'm really happy to introduce Bobby Kennedy to you and thank you again for coming. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Tony. Thank you all for being here tonight. I apologize for coming in and then disappearing. I had a, a TV show scheduled on uh, with Chris Cuomo outside in a van, <laughs> and they had promised us they had promised us D block, which would have been workable. But then they had a breaking news story, so I was out there sweating, knowing you guys were all. And I actually walked out while. Stuart was doing his first introduction of me, so it was not a it was not a relaxing experience out there. But I really apologize to all of you for keeping you waiting, and I thank you for your forbearance. Uh, and I thank Stuart so much and Priscilla for this for making this evening uh, so wonderful. And Tony, who's my friend, who's been my publisher for about a decade, has published about ten of my books and. Um, has, uh, but more importantly, he's published books that nobody else published. He published a thousand books a year, and he published his books that nobody else will touch. And there are a lot of stuff I don't agree with, uh, but it's stuff that needs to be said, <laughs> and stuff to be, a lot of, that I do. But it's stuff that, that has to be said. We're in a democracy, and we're, you know, we need to be able to talk about ideas and we need to be able to talk about things that are outlandish. Right. And I've, as I've said many times before, the First Amendment was written not to protect easy speech, not to protect the kind of speech that we all want to hear, that we're all comfortable with. It was to protect the unpleasant speech, the speech that none of us wants to hear, the speech that everybody wants to silence, the annoying voices, the dissenting voices, and Tony's been one of the most um, uh, forthright and relentless crusaders for free speech on the American landscape. Thank you. Oh, hey, Tony! Hey, Tony. Hey, Tony. Um, and I want to thank again Stuart for bringing me back to this house. I was at this house many times as a kid. Um, uh, uh, Charlie Bartlett, who was one of my uncle's best friends, was the owner of this house at that time, and he was a publisher. And my aunt Jackie did a column for him called The Inquiring Photographer, where she would take a picture of somebody and then do a short interview with them. And they, the first time she met my uncle was in one of those interviews. And she asked him a question during that interview he asked him what he thought his most important quality was. And he surprised her with his answer. He, she assumed that he would say courage because he had written a Pulitzer Prize winning book on courage, Profiles in Courage. He was the only president who has won the Purple Heart. He was a hero during the war. He rescued his crew and he, uh, and he, he had demonstrated his own heroic qualities already by that time. But the answer he gave her was curiosity. And, uh, you know, that's a quality that I think all of us need to cultivate. And that I see, when I see it in people, I associate it with open minds. I associate it with compassion. I associate it with empathy with the capacity to put yourself in other people's shoes. And I think that was my uncle's best prep quality. I think that was the quality that allowed him during the thousand days that he was in office to keep this country out of war. 
he told in another in a mansion very close to here, he told Catherine Graham's mansion, he told one of his uh, best friends, Ben Bradley, who was then the publisher of the Washington, or the editor in chief of the Washington Post, and Graham was the publisher. Um, Bradley asked him what he wanted on his, as his epithet on his gravestone. This is when he was already president, and he said he kept the peace. He said the primary job of a president of the United States is to keep the country out of war. And uh, he said uh, <laughs> that he didn't want children in Africa and Asia when they heard about the United States of America to think of a man with a gun. He wanted them to think of a Peace Corps volunteer. He wanted them to think of the Alliance for Progress. He wanted them to think of USAID, which he created those two agencies in order to lift and run the oligarchs and all the foreign, you know, US foreign policy up to that point had been to funnel money to the oligarchs who said, and to the you know, dictators who said, we hate communists, and to the militaries who supported them. And meanwhile, they were starving and oppressing their own poor. And my uncle said, that is, the, that, that is a formula for revolution. And you're creating communists by doing that. And he said, America needs to be on the side of the poor. Actually, his, his, he had his two favorite trips as president. One was to Ireland, in which he famous when he left Shannon Airport, and the entire Irish people showed up to see the first Irish Catholic president, a real source of pride to their nation. Um, but and he famously told them as he left the Shannon Airport that I'll be back in the springtime, and that's a promise that he could never keep. But his other favorite trip during his presidency was to Colombia, where he met the, the leader, Yeres Camargo, who was one of the greatest Latin American leaders. And there's a square that's now called John F. Kennedy Square. There's a whole neighborhood in Bogota named after my uncle. And two million people showed up to see him in the square. And yet, as Scott Margo said to my uncle, and my, my uncle, Jackie, later said after, after Jack was killed, he said that he was more impressed with Yeres Carmargo than any leader, than any statesman. They had met De Gaulle. They had met Eamon de Valera, the George Washington of, of, of Ireland. They had met all these extraordinary leaders, uh, Sukarno, et cetera the liberator of Indonesia, but they, they said of all the leaders they met, Yeres Karmargo was the most gifted. And Yeres Karmargo said to my uncle, do you know why they love you? And my uncle said, why? And he said, because you put America on the side of the poor, they think that. And um, you know, my uncle kept the country out of war. He didn't send a single combat troop abroad during his presidency. He was in, he realized, four months into his presidency during the Bay of Pigs invasion that the CIA, the intelligence apparatus, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that they felt that their job was to provide a continuous pipeline of wars with a military industrial complex. And uh, I was at his inauguration as a six-year-old kid, but I remember it like it was yesterday. And, uh, and three days before, on my birthday, January 17, 1961, Eisenhower, the outgoing president, gave his farewell address in which he warned Americans against the rise of a military-industrial complex that would destroy American democracy, that would turn us into an imperium abroad and a surveillance state at home. And my uncle was determined not to let that happen four months in when he was lied to by the CIA about the Bay of Pigs. At the height, he took public, when the men were dying, 2,200 men on the beach, some of them dying, the rest being captured. He took public blame for it, but privately he said to his aides, I want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. And for the next three years, he was battling against that apparatus to keep the country out of war. They wanted to go in 60 to 61 into Cuba, 62 into Berlin, 62 into Cuba again. Um, 
uh, 61 into Laos, which he refused. They called him a traitor. He refused to send combat troops to Vietnam. They wanted 250,000. He sent 16,000 advisors, ultimately under great pressure, Green Berets. And um, he, by the way, he sent, he sent more than that. He sent about 20,000 troops to get one black man, James Meredith, to, into Old Miss in Oxford, Mississippi. It was a small number of troops. And in uh, November of 1963, or October 23rd, 1963, he heard that a Green Beret had died, and he called Walt Rostow, who was one of his aides, and he said, I want, a I want a casualty list. And Rostow brought him that list, and it was 75 Americans had died, and he said, that's too many. I'm bringing them all home. And that afternoon, he signed National Security Order 263, ordering all combat troops, all military personnel home from Vietnam by 65 with the first thousand coming home in December of 63, so a month later. Three we or four weeks of the day after he signed that order, he was murdered. And a week after that, President Johnson remanded that order and then sent 250,000 troops there. And, you know, my father ran against the war in 68, was killed. Um, Nixon became president, sent 500,000 troops there. 56,000 never came home, including my cousin, George Skakel, who was killed in the Tet Offensive. And um, but one of the ways that my uncle kept us out of war was because he said, always put yourself in the shoes of your opponent. And he was able, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, to put himself into the shoes of, of Khrushchev and understand, and, and he put in a hotline to Khrushchev for the first time. The CIA had no idea what was happening in the Kremlin, because there was a mole at Langley, and all the spies, as soon as they turned, were killed. So they didn't know who it was. They saw it as a monolith. And my uncle said, it couldn't be that. It's got to be just like Boston, where everybody's fighting each other on the local level. That's how politics works. <laughs> and, and he found out that was true, and then he started this extraordinary correspondence with Khrushchev where they, they sent 26 letters to each other, and secretly. My father had a friend, my father and mother, called Georgi Bolshkoi, who was a KGB spy, and he, he used to come to our house at Hickory Hill all the time. The State Department was horrified because everybody knew he was a spy. And but we loved him as kids because he would do the Cossack dancing and he would do, he had all these kind of tricks and he would do rope climbing contests with my dad and push up contests. And the first of the letters that Khrushchev knew, my father trusted him. And the first of the letters, he didn't want to go through his own apparatus, so he gave it to Bolshevik. And Bolshevik came and gave it to my dad. And they smuggled 26 private letters back and forth to each other, these extraordinary personal letters talking about their lives, their children. And they installed a hotline. So there was a red phone at the White House and also in our house at the Cape. And we all knew not to touch it because if you lifted it up, Khrushchev was getting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was that curiosity that he had that allowed him to understand it, it couldn't be a monolith. They couldn't all be evil people like these cartoon depictions that we always get about our enemies. It has to be more complicated than that. And they realized you know, Khrushchev and my uncle were both war heroes. They had both fought and they, did, they both understood how bad war was. Khrushchev had been at Stalingrad, and, uh, which was the worst battle of, the, of World War II. And neither of them wanted to get us into another war. And, you know, because of my uncle's forbearance and because of his decision to project economic power abroad rather than military power, there are today more statues to John Kennedy, more boulevards named after him, more avenues, more streets, more neighborhoods, or universities in Latin America and Africa and Asia than any other president, U.S. president, and probably more than all the other presidents combined. And I run into people from Africa all the time. I ran into one last night whose name is Kennedy. 
because of the love and affection people had for our country all over the world. And that was a huge asset for us. You know, we've spent $8 trillion on wars over the past 20 years and bombing things, you know, with no, and made ourselves less safe a home and abroad, less popular, fewer friends. BRICS is a direct result of that. And we're bankrupt now. We got, our kids are $34 trillion in debt to pay for this. During that same period, the Chinese have spent $8 trillion while we've been bombing bridges, ports, hospitals, schools, the Chinese have been building them. And they've, you know, with their Belt and Road program, they're now the biggest creditor in Latin America and in almost every, Asia, every country in, in Africa. That's where we were 10 years ago. And we don't even have relationships with these countries anymore. And President Trump's not gonna bring this back. President Biden is not going to, you know, President Trump, I believe, wants to, you know, drain the swamp. I think he was sincere when he said that. But he appointed John Bolton to run the NSA. He's a swamp creature, like the template for swamp creatures. And, you know, Scott Gottlieb, who is Pfizer's business partner, to, to run FDA and, you know, and, and Pfizer and Gottlieb did Operation Warp Speed, an $88 billion gift to Pfizer, and then went back to collect his, his paycheck on the Pfizer uh, board. Oh, so, um, President Biden is not going to unravel it. President Trump is not going to do it. And, you know, I think I'm the only candidate that knows how to do this, that understands how badly we need to do this in this country if we're going to return the middle class and if we're going to give our kids a chance. So I want to thank again, Stuart, for hosting this event and, you know, for all of you. And I feel such positive energy, good energy and love for, from so many of you. And I hope to meet all of you and to get my picture taken with everybody here. Yeah. And I really apologize to you all for being late and keeping you waiting. Thank you. Yeah. Let's go! Hey, Rolling Out, this is Crystal Jordan, your host, and I am actually on assignment today. This is the weekend of Martin Luther King Jr.'s holiday, and I am honored to be sitting with our one of our uh, candidates for the 2024 presidential race. I am sitting here next to uh, Mr. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. First of all, thank you so much for sitting down and talking to Rolling Out, and welcome to Atlanta. Crystal, thanks for having me. Well, we're excited. Like I said, this is um, this is an exciting weekend. Uh, we know that living here in Atlanta, Rolling Out has been a part of this community since 1996. And so we've had an opportunity to celebrate Martin Luther King holiday. But a lot of people don't really realize that the relationship between the Kennedys and the King family and the history there with the civil rights movement goes back so much further than what a lot of people realize. Can you share a little bit about what some people may not know about the history between your family, the Kennedys, and the King family? Yeah, my uncle, John F. Kennedy, was uh, president, was running for president of the United States in 1960. My father was his campaign manager. And they were both from Boston, and civil rights was not really on their radar. It was, you know, they were concerned about other issues, about organized crime, about foreign policy. Um, but uh, during the election in October of 1960, so that would have been uh, one month before the election, mm -hmm. Martin Luther King was arrested in DeKalb County, Georgia, and he was arrested because. Some of the members of SNCC, of the, uh, um, which was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, run by John Lewis, had persuaded him against his better judgment to participate in a lunch counter sit-in. Yes. And he had been sentenced to jail. And he, he, in the middle of the night, he was woken up in the county jail at 4 o'clock in the morning. He didn't know where he was going. They never, the police never told him. He thought he may be going to an execution. He was uh, brought into what he called cracker country, uh, where 
uh, lynching would not have been objected to by the local community, and they, but they were really bringing him to a state prison. Mm -hmm. And Coretta King was panicked when they, when she found out he'd been moved, and she tried. To, she got in touch with my uncle through Harry Belafonte, who was a close friend of my of our of the Kennedys, mm -hmm. but he was also funding the civil rights movement at that time. And he got in touch with my uncle, Sergeant Shriver, mm -hmm. who then went to John Kennedy, who was a senator, and said, um, and asked him to intervene. My uncle's staff did not want him to do it. My father had cut a deal with three southern governors to uh, to support my uncle, but they all said that if my uncle, if John Kennedy supported Martin Luther King, that, that they would switch their support to Nixon. Um, but in a private conversation without my father present, my other uncle, Sarge Shriver, persuaded uh, John Kennedy to call Coretta King. And he called her just a, a comfort call. And my father then immediately found out about it, and he told my uncle Sarge Shriver, you just cost us the election. And now, Martin Luther King had gone to Nixon first. I mean, Coretta had gone to Nixon first. Because Nixon was very close with Martin Luther King at that point. Mm -hmm. And Martin Luther King was supporting him at that point. And, um, you know, at that point, most blacks were voting Republican in the South because they were Lincoln Republicans. And, um, but, but Nixon would not return her phone calls. And that destroyed the relationship from, with King and Nixon from then on. My father was angry at Sarge Shriver for getting my uncle to do that. My father came back to our home, which was McLean, Virginia, and he was on his way to the airport, which was 15 minutes away, mm -hmm. and he began thinking about it, and he hated bullies, and he began thinking about it in that framework, and by the time he got to the National Airport, he was steaming. And he personally, he, he called his staff, he said, I want the name, I want the telephone number for that sheriff. He called the sheriff at night, mm -hmm. and then he called the judge, and then he called the governor, Governor Van Dever, and he said, uh, is there something you can do to get Martin Luther King out of jail? Van Dever said, I don't think I can, and my father said, I want you to try, and then I want you to call me back and tell me what you did. And the next morning he was released, the judge released him. So from then on, my family had a very close relationship with the Kings, and then you know the big by, by 1962, civil rights was the was the biggest issue for them, the presidency. Mm -hmm. um, they helped them with the Freedom Riders, and you know, the Freedom Riders at that time there had been a federal a Supreme Court case mm -hmm. that said you could not that the bus companies, the Greyhound company that was putting blacks in the back of the bus, mm -hmm. could not do that on the interstate commerce. And the Freedom Riders were a bunch of young kids, and they decided to test that out in the Deep South. Yeah. And one of their buses was burned in, in Anniston. They were severely, savagely beaten in Anniston and then in Montgomery. And my father then sent, at King's request, sent 400 U.S. Marshals to guard them. And he helped King with the Selma March with Viola Lee Luzzo. Uh, King at that point with it, had a boycott going in Montgomery, Alabama against the businesses. My father refereed the settlement of that. Mm -hmm. um, and he helped him in, with the housing discrimination in Chicago. And then he helped him organize the March on Washington in 1963. And uh, when my, my Martin Luther King came out against the Vietnam War in April of 1967, and a lot of the other civil rights leaders did not want him to do that. They mm -hmm. wanted to stay in his lane. Right. But he said the war is, we can't separate the two issues, civil rights and the war. The war is uh, impoverishing the poverty program, mm -hmm. and it also, it's all black kids who are fighting that war. Mm -hmm. And they're bringing home the violence. And so, um, he came out against the war almost to the day that he gave that famous speech against the Vietnam War. He was murdered. My father was running at that time for President of the United States, and he was in Indianapolis when he found out uh, Martin, Martin was murdered. Mm -hmm. And he, and by the way, 
after he got Martin Luther King out of prison, Daddy King, mm -hmm. Martin's dad, gave a sermon at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, in which he endorsed my uncle. And and because of that, my uncle won the presidency. It was the narrowest margin in history. Mm -hmm. So it cemented the relationship between our families. And my father learned that Martin Luther King, when he was about to speak in a you know in a, a black section in Indianapolis, my father learned that Martin Luther King had been killed. He gave impromptu one of the best speeches of his career. Yeah and urging peace. He talked about his own brother had been killed by a white man. Mm -hmm. And he said what we need is healing. Right. You know, we need to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of the world. And of 120 cities that rioted that night, including the city I was in, Washington, which was burned to the ground, mm -hmm. um, Indianapolis was the only city that didn't riot. And that is a tribute to my father's speech. And then when my dad was killed, when my dad died, I was with him in Los Angeles, and Coretta Scott King was in the hospital with us. And then she flew back with us with my father's body on the plane, and she then uh, took that train ride to Washington, D.C., with two and a half million people on the train track, mm -hmm. and remained very, very close friends with my, with my mother, um, you know, uh, their whole lives. And, you know, I grew up very, very close to Marty, King, to mm -hmm. Martin's son. Uh, so, you know, our families have been very close through all those years. Yeah, that's a beautiful story, especially, like I said, with this weekend. And I also think it kind of brings us full circle. Um, I couldn't help but thinking about the fact that you mentioned that there were students, young students, that were part of the Freedom Riders that were, you know, adamant about change. And interestingly enough, when I was talking about coming here and talking to you, a lot of the young people that are a part of our staff are like, you know, we are, we are tired of what's going on in the world right now, we're not happy, and we're definitely open to hearing someone that can bring us a message that appeals to us. And so I'm wondering when you hear that type of feedback from young people, and we know that you are running as an independent candidate, and for so long, specifically the African American community feels like their vote has been kind of used. At one point, the majority of African Americans were Republican, and then for the, for the last uh, few decades, it's been democratic and a lot of people don't even know that history so with you coming and offering something very different what do you think is the is could be the appeal and why did you decide to to run on the independent party uh, I uh, you know I ran because I had because the Democrats were fixing the rules to make sure that nobody could challenge President Biden there's a lot of as you know there's a lot of African Americans who are um, who were uh, who were suspect of President Biden because of the, uh, his uh, sponsorship of the 1986 uh, drug laws and then the omnibus law in 1994 uh, that created the the, uh, the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. that, that 94, you know, the 86 law made crack cocaine uh, punishable a hundred times the sentence that you would get for powder cocaine, mm -hmm. and the uh, and the, the only difference between those two is that powder cocaine was used by white kids and crack cocaine was used by black kids. Mm -hmm. And it doubled, that, uh, that law which President Biden sponsored doubled the amount of, of blacks in prison mm -hmm. at that time. So between 1865 and 1994, mm -hmm. that it, there were a certain number of blacks in prison, and that number was doubled in eight years because of that law. And the law, you know, was bad, and, and President Biden has acknowledged that it was a bad law, but it's, uh, it, it, but he's done nothing to change it. And we need to end the, the you know, there's people in jail from marijuana. One in every three blacks you now going to end up in prison, black males. Mm -hmm. And um, and we need to change that because once you go to prison, it's a lifetime sentence. You right. become a second-class citizen in your life. Let me talk about you know what I'm doing, uh, what my program is to get an economic vitality back in the young generation. Mm -hmm. My father in 1966 walked through Bedford Stuyvesant, which was one of the poorest um, minority communities in New York, mm -hmm. and he. He saw something in that community that was unusual. 
which was there was a high degree of home ownership. Even though all the indicia of poverty were present, mm -hmm. people were taking care of their homes, mm -hmm. people had flower pots on their homes, people were painting the stoops, they were sitting on them, there was a sense of community. And my father decided to devote his energies to bringing economic vitality to that community. Mm -hmm. And he, at that point on Fulton Street, in bed all the stores were boarded up. Mm -hmm. And he realized that the black community needed two things. It needed uh, access to capital, mm -hmm. which, you know, those communities are redlined. Uh, they, the, the banks, even when they don't officially redline them, are right. secretly redlining them. Mm -hmm. They're denying home improvement loans, home ownership loans, and that, when you do that, you're going to get crime. Mm -hmm. And my father, um, began, you know, basically started an empowerment zone there, an opportunity zone, and he brought in, he also knew that there was no, there wasn't a lot of accrued business knowledge. Mm -hmm. There was a huge entrepreneurial spirit, but people did not know how to do accounting, they didn't know how to do inventory, all the things that you need to know, it's which, you know, as a graduate of Harvard, he, if he wanted to start a business, he could call somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you live in those communities, you didn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And so he began bringing business people from the top corporations in America give one day a week mm -hmm. to spend at bed -Stuy. When he died, I took over his place on the board. And I've served there for 30 years, and I've watched that community become rejuvenated and taken part in it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we did it by, um, through tax credits, through creating opportunity zones, through, through teaching accrued business knowledge, mm -hmm. um, through micro loan programs and uh, and through providing daycare so that people can have jobs mm -hmm. and all of the things that you need to do. Today, Fulton Street and Atlantic Avenue, every story in them, uh, on those streets is open. There's mm -hmm. a vibrant uh, entrepreneurship in that community and it's become a model uh, for community development yeah. all around the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to do that uh, for this country. Well, that is that is what our readers want to know about. Like I said, we have a large population of our readers are interested in entrepreneurship. And I love everything that you just said. That's a wonderful example. I guess I would want to ask you, you know, for our last question here, I know we, your, your time is limited, but for the, for the homeowner, for the African-American business owner that has not gone to Harvard, but still has pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, so to speak, and has started their business, but is is steadily fighting against you know issues because they didn't have those loans, they didn't have that capital. What would your message be, and what what why should we put you in office? I mean, quite quite honestly, what can you tell our community about what you want to do when it comes to um, empowering our communities, empowering those entrepreneurs that have been out there working, struggling, even with you know knowing that they are they're starting out ten steps behind you know their 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 white counterparts. Uh, in, in terms of why should people believe me, well, I would say this, I, I'm not a politician. I never intended to run for president of the United States. Mm -hmm. But I, if you look at what I've been doing for the past 40 years, mm -hmm. it is a commitment to those issues. It's a commitment to environmental justice, commitment to business development in the black community. I have a long track record of doing that. And, you know, I believe that I'm in a better position to do that because of what I've done with my life mm -hmm. than anybody else who's running for president. The commitment I have, the, the, there's a lot of things that need to be done in the black community. The first is fix the education system. We need education choice. We need the capacity to expand the charter schools in New York. There's 20,000 kids who are going to one charter school, and there and it's on, and there there's a long list of. 100,000 kids who want to get into it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they're being stifled. And those charter schools do miracles for kids. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what we're finding is that the, uh, the ability to get into college is not cultural, it's not environmental, it's not economic, mm -hmm. it's bad schools. Mm -hmm. That's what's blocking people. Mm -hmm. And when you give people good schools with discipline and a good education, the, you know, the Success School in New York, which is a charter school, almost all black, 
is now outperforming the best high schools in terms of college placement and graduation in New York, uh, better than, than uh, Scarsdale High, which is one of the highest in, in New York. Well, we can do that, but we need to make that available. And we need the school choice. We need to say to black parents, um, you don't need to keep your kids in the school that's not working for them. You can have a choice to move someplace else. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is we need access to capital. There's a, and the, the problem is that there's only 20 black-owned banks in our country. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're, they're all underfunded and funded by the Fed. And when you fund those black-owned banks, they spend money in those communities. We, um, and, you know, we need to, and that's what I'll do. Mm -hmm. I'll make sure that those black-owned banks are getting adequate cash. Mm -hmm. That, that cash is being directed to those communities for home improvement loans, for business loans, and uh, you know, one of the things, one part of liberal ideology is that we have to end racism. Right. You're never going to end racism. Right. It's part of who we are. Right. It's the 20,000 generations that we spend wandering the African savanna and little tribal groups fighting each other. And tribalism is hardwired into our system. Mm -hmm. But what you need to do is equip kids so that racism doesn't affect them. And you know, when I was a kid, they, my uncle was the first Catholic president. It was tremendous bigotry against Catholics. I was called when I was a kid all kinds of names, a mick, a mackerel snatcher, all these names that were derogatory for my religion. Mm -hmm. It never affected me because I had confidence in myself. I knew I was getting a good education. I had a family that loved me. I knew my life was going to be. So when somebody would say that stuff to me, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't be thinking, what's wrong with me? I'd be thinking, what's wrong with that person? <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's where we want black kids to be able to, to be resilient right. so that when they do encounter those kind of challenges, mm -hmm. they're able to cope with them because they have an education. Right because they have a future, because they're proud of their family, because right. their dad is working and running There's the local economic support, support system. Right, and if you've got economic opportunity, you don't need anything. You can have everybody in the world hate you, and it's not going to matter. I love it. that. And on that note, <laughs> it's definitely what our viewers are wanting to hear. It's not about necessarily ending racism. It really is yep. about allowing us to have access to things that should have been that we should have had access the entire time, and I appreciate a candidate actually speaking to the truth and letting us know that I'm not going to be able to fix racism, but what I can do is stop uh, the gatekeepers that are keeping your community from being able to be economically empowered. Exactly. Okay. Thank you so much. What an amazing honor to be able to sit with you on Martin Luther King uh, Holiday Weekend. I'm looking forward to this conversation. But again, from the family here at Rolling Out, we want to thank you and look forward to hearing more from you over 2024. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. In his only television interview for the political perspective today is independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, welcome. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Let's start with the Federal Reserve, Robert. And, and you need to tell us and the viewers, potential voters maybe, how you view the Fed and its success in bringing down inflation since a year ago, March. And thanks, Liz, for having me. I'm really happy to be here on this show. Um, I mean, I, you know, I'm happy that the inflation rate appears to be at least temporarily under control. But inflation is the most pernicious and insidious regressive tax on the poor. But high interest rates are also an enormous tax on the poor. The access to capital now that I'm seeing in poor neighborhoods all over the country is bankrupting small business in those neighborhoods. Our kids cannot get into a home because the interest rates have gone from 3% two years ago to, uh, for them, the real cost about 7.5 or 8% inflation to buy a home. And, uh, and the cost of housing has gone from $215,000 average cost in this country the 400,000, so you have an entire generation of kids that is not getting into homes. The real, the, you know, the long-term issue is spending, because inflation and high interest rates are just symptoms, they're just medicine, and they both are poisonous medicines. 
And so we need to get spending under control. We need to dramatically reduce the military spending. War in Ukraine has already com we've already committed $113 billion to that. President Biden wants to raise the stakes. Two hundred billion. We we've spent we've wasted eight trillion dollars on useless wars over twenty years that have made Americans less safe abroad and at home and are bankrupting our country. We need to also get health care costs under and nobody's under control. That's the biggest cost. Four point three trillion a year. Nobody's talking about that except for me, and I'm the one who can bring those health care costs well, under control. Uh, hold on. To be fair, uh, President Biden has talked about uh, attacking, you know, high drug prices. Uh, Bernie Sanders just last week came out and said he was ready to subpoena three big pharma company CEOs because he's infuriated that the United States consumers are paying 10 times what France is paying. I mean, it's it's. These are developed countries. Forget Africa. Uh, so there are people out there that are trying to work on this. How would you tackle something like that? Well, yeah, and those are good starts to start you know, standing back against pharmaceutical companies that now own Congress and own the regulatory agencies. But the biggest thing we need to do is to reduce the chronic disease epidemic. And when my uncle was president, we were paying in 1960, 63, we were paying about 4% of GDP on health care. Today, it's 20%. And the principal addition is chronic disease. So we've gone up to $4.3 trillion a year. We spend more than any other per capita nation in the world. We have the worst health outcomes. Why is that? Because we, the United States of America, has the highest chronic disease burden of any country in the world. We have neurological disease, obesity, autoimmune diseases that suddenly appeared in the 1990s and that are now the principal cause. 93 percent of Medicare bills are chronic disease. And, you know, we have the highest death rate during COVID. We had 16 percent of the COVID deaths. We only have 4.2 percent of the world population. So why is that? Well, CDC says because we have the highest chronic disease rate. So that's the real pandemic. And, and NIH will not do those studies to find out. We know there in, these are environmental toxins that are causing this. Well, can Genes I, can I do interrupt not cause you? Because I, I'm looking right now as a business network. I'm looking right now, and the the stock market is going down. They want more punch bowl filling. They would like to see rates cut so that the money to borrow for whatever growth, whatever it is, uh, becomes cheaper. And today, uh, Jay Powell said, no, that is not going to happen. You know, I, I've seen some of your opinions on the Federal Reserve and, and specifically say, for example, the U.S. dollar, Bitcoin, and how you would uh, enable no taxes for people who make money off Bitcoin. And on top of everything else, you have also specifically said that you propose this idea to back the dollar with Bitcoin, beginning, though, with a very small number of treasuries. Uh, that's a very complicated issue, considering Bitcoin is incredibly volatile in price, although people are now getting to invest in it due to the Bitcoin spot ETFs. Yeah, well, first of all, I think we, we need to fix the Fed. We need to return U.S. sovereignty to the Fed. We need to return transparency to the Fed. We need to make the Fed more responsive to the markets and more responsive to the 12 regional banks, rather than to have the kind of voodoo that now dictates Fed policy, and that is designed, really, to shift wealth upward to this new oligarchy of billionaires. In terms of my proposals, what I said is that I, I don't propose that all transactions in Bitcoin be untaxed, but that there be a cap to up to a certain amount. If if you if you if if you uh, if you allow uh, big holders like BlackRock to uh, to escape taxation on the increases in uh, in value for Bitcoin, you'd you'd give a windfall of trillions of dollars to the richest people in our country, which they don't need. But people who have small transactions are buying gasoline or buying uh, uh, okay. who are using it. We want to encourage people to use hard currency in the marketplace. My my other proposal is very very modest, which is that we use a basket 
of hard currencies, including platinum, including gold, and including uh, uh, perhaps Bitcoin, uh, to, to uh, as a basis for maybe 1 percent of certain classes of T-bills, and see what happens, see if that has any capacity to inject discipline into uh, uh, onto inflationary policies. Hmm. I need to ask you some some race, presidential race questions. Uh, you are running as an independent. Are you going to switch to libertarian? Can you just clarify that right here, right now? You know, we're talking to a lot of uh, the individual parties, so, and we'll continue to do that talk. We haven't made up our mind yet, but right now, we have the capacity to get on the ballot in every state as an independent candidate, okay. and uh, and that is our plan at the moment. So that you know, people have reached out to us from other parties, and we're talking to a number of other people. Um, the border, really quickly, Donald Trump and Speaker Johnson at the moment uh, appear to be at least on the same side as slow walking the border plan that uh, Senate Republicans are pushing here, not just Democrats, but Senate Republicans. Obviously, the border is a disaster at the moment. There are people flooding over it constantly. What is your particular plan, if you could give it to us pretty quickly here, because we're running out of time, to fix that border from California through to Texas? Yeah, I, I will seal the border. Uh, I will use physical barriers in some of that. That's a 2,200-mile uh, border, and in some of it, you require physical barriers. The 27 gaps in the wall need to be filled. In the countryside, the rural areas, we need to reinstall the fences. Many of that were, them were removed, the long-range cameras, the video, the, uh, the sensor equipment, and the lights. And we need to put more border patro uh, patrolmen on the border. We need to put asylum court judges. We need to flood the, the border right now with asylum court judges so a lot of those uh, cases can be adjudicated before people come into our country or before they have long stick and be turned back at the border, in other words. And then it, we should reinstate the Migratory Protect the Migrant Protection Act, which requires a lot of the asylum cases to be adjudicated in Mexico if the people are coming from a different country to Mexico. When I was at the border, I interviewed about 110 people coming across between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. in Yuma, and only two of them even had asylum claims. So the rest of them said, I'm here for a job, and those people should not be allowed in our country except through legal yeah. immigration. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people would absolutely agree with you on that. Uh, thank you. We hope you'll come back as the race continues. Super Tuesday coming up. We shall see exactly what happens there. Robert F. Kennedy, Jr., thanks for coming on. <laughs> thank you so much for having me, Les. In 2024, independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. denied reports that he could be Donald Trump's vice president if elected. I have to ask, the latest speculation is that maybe, maybe you would be the VP for Trump. Would you ever do that? Uh, I don't think that my marriage would survive it. I think he's right. <laughs> Just president. That's all you want. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. RFK also appeared on Fox News yesterday to discuss his presidential run and his chances as an independent in this election year. Is the two-party system broken? It's definitely broken, and I think more and more people are seeing how corrupt it is. And the corruption is increasing. You know, there was a um, Bernie Sanders, some of Bernie Sanders' followers uh, sued the Democratic Party a couple of years after 2016 in federal court right. and the, for fixing the, the vote against Bernie. And the federal judge said, yeah, it is against their own rules. They, broke, they violated their own rules, but they are a club and they're allowed to do that. Mm. And that ruling gave the party, empowered the party with permission because before that they were at least pretending to, uh, uh, to be neutral in elections and to not fix the outcome. And now they have no restraints. And you've got, you know, all this corporate money 
pouring into them, you know, from these big military contractors, from the pharmaceutical right. companies, and uh, and and both parties are receiving the money from the same groups, and it's fixed against the American, it's rigged against the American public. Of course, uh, the system is such that you've got to get ballot access on all 50 states. Uh, yeah. We're just about out of time for the segment. Are you going to be able to do that? Yeah, we will be in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. And speaking of Bernie Sanders, Democratic strategist James Carville said the Vermont senator is one of the reasons that Trump won in 2016. I don't want to relitigate 2016, but Bernie Sanders cost is a reason. It's one of the reasons that Trump is at. I think this is great that Nikki Haley is saying, "I hats off to these Republican donors that continue to support her." I mean, mm -hmm. you know, obviously she doesn't have that much chance, but every day that she's in there, every day that she's on the attack, is a good day. What's incredible there? I mean, apart from saying, I don't want to relitigate 2016, but let me relitigate 2016, is that he's making this backhanded compliment that just like Bernie was a spoiler in 2016, Nikki Haley is going to be a spoiler for uh, Biden. I don't know that either and things are true. I, I, if What's the evidence that— uh, like, doesn't, <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't make sense. Yeah. It's, it's the idea that— First of all, Bernie Sanders in 2016 voted for Hillary Clinton in higher numbers and a higher percentage than Hillary voters in 20, uh, 2008, when she lost the primary, voted for Barack Obama. More Hillary voters in 2008 held out because, for whatever reason, they didn't like Barack Obama than, than Bernie Sanders supporters, which overwhelmingly fell in line and voted for Hillary yeah. Clinton. I, I think it's that she didn't campaign in the two states she ended up losing, <laughs> right. but, uh, more, more you know, galaxy brain take. Right. Moreover, the comparing Nikki Haley, who's what like sixty points behind in the polls, to Bernie Sanders, who got like forty four percent of the primary vote in two thousand and sixteen and came very close to winning and might have, frankly, won, but for the DNC uh, shenanigans that RFK Jr. was alluding to, where in their own lawsuit, uh, the 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 DNC argued that it had a right to rig the primary in favor of its preferred candidate. Who knows what would have happened? So it, it, the comparison is ridiculous all over the place. And, and there's no evidence, frankly, that Nikki Haley and what she's doing is hurting Trump right. at all from a general election standpoint. It's, maybe it's making him a little mad from day to day, but there's no real question he's going to beat her unless, again, something weird happens with the legal situation, right. which really has nothing to do with Nikki Haley's own efforts. Um, there's no evidence this is causing, this is dampening enthusiasm for Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. In fact, we had new polling this morning from Bloomberg Morning Consult. I think we can put that up, uh, showing the polling. Biden's uh, Trump's polling versus Biden, all states he's up six, and then specifically in the swing states, North Carolina, Trump plus ten, Nevada, Trump plus eight, Georgia, Trump plus eight, Wisconsin, Trump plus five, Michigan, Trump plus five, Pennsylvania, and Arizona, Trump up just plus three. So Trump's winning all of the all yeah. of the swing states right now. Um, you know, maybe there's time for Joe Biden. I guess I'd be looking at Arizona and Pennsylvania with a sliver of hope, but there, but. This is all good news for Trump. He's not, like, losing momentum. He's not even the candidate yet. Now, maybe when he becomes the candidate and the media focuses more on what he's saying, people will recall why they didn't want to vote for Trump in 2020. I guess that has to be the theory of Biden's campaign right now. But um, th there's no evidence that he's suffering because of Nikki Haley. There's no evidence right now he's suffering at all. If the election were held today, he would win decisively. There's just not a big enough slice of Republican voters that are interested in Nikki Haley right now to be— no. that concerned about those voters not falling in line and voting for uh, Trump or whoever the Republican nominee is. I mean, to the extent that she overperformed in New Hampshire, it was largely because so many Democrats in New Hampshire voted for her. She does very well with Democrats. And I don't, I don't even particularly mean that as a slight, but realistically speaking, it's just absurd to compare that to the Bernie phenomenon. And one other point about the, <laughs> the Bernie phenomenon is that if you really were concerned about beating Trump, Polls in advance of the 2016 election showed that Bernie Sanders was up on Trump significantly, often like 10 points up compared to Hillary's four points up. Hillary remained within the margin of error in polling with Trump for all but about two weeks around the time of the Access Hollywood uh, tape. It was close throughout, much closer than it should have been. So the idea that the, Dem the DNC rigged the primary in favor of the candidate that was less likely to beat Donald Trump, and then you're going to blame the candidate who was running to actually have a chance of defeating Donald Trump well, Hillary was is both, bizarre. Hillary was both an incredibly weak candidate whose weaknesses were just not 
recognized by Democratic elites who were so blinded to that. It was so, sexism, it's didn't you hear? Turn, right, that's, <laughs> that they told us uh, over and over again. And then one of the worst run campaigns in terms of the demonization of half of the country, the refusal to campaign and what ended up being, and what were clear, like, that, that's not hindsight, it was clear ahead of time that those were going to be the swing states. Those were where, um, where working class um, Rust Belt voters were uh, were more pro-Trump, and were, you know, people who'd voted for Obama twice were not sold on the Hillary message, and she just didn't campaign there. Yeah, 100%. She picked a total non-entity for VP a week ago. I'm sure that it's been litigated on the show I many know, times. I know, I know, I'm sorry. This is like my bugaboo. No, 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 it's, it's, that's fair. But before we move on, what did you make of Cheryl Hines's um, uh, response <laughs> to that reporter's question cute. about being You know, VP? I think they, they look cute together on TV. That's a very shallow <laughs> thing to say about a political, but they're also celebrities, so. Uh, no, RFK Jr. has been very clear that he doesn't want to be part of the Trump ticket of the Trump administration or the Biden administration, he is running his own independent campaign for president, and uh, Cheryl Hines supports him. We've heard a little bit from her on Do you, do you her, think uh, that kind of glib well. remark um, hurts him with a significant part of his base that I think likes both he and Trump? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, if he li this is no this isn't a Vivek situation. If he liked Trump so much, why is he running against him? Mm -hmm. he, he has differences with Donald Trump and with Joe Biden. Um, and he's going, to, and you know, he's—I mean—he's running obviously a lot of the, I guess, co you know, COVID mandate opposition. But on a lot of that, that's some of Trump's weakest issues with his own base is the perception that he, you know, sold the country out to Dr. Fauci. So uh, I, I don't think that's going to shake any any Trump to RFK people. Yeah, I just liked watching her jaw clench when the question was asked. <laughs> All right, stick around. We're rising right after this. First Democrat, then Independent, and now potentially Libertarian, just a few weeks ago, Robert Kennedy Jr. was in North Carolina trying to get on the ballot as an Independent running for president. But Kennedy now says he's considering the Libertarian Party. We're digging deeper into what that means for the election and what may be behind that thinking. In mid-January, RFK Jr. roused his supporters in Raleigh. He was confident he would get the signatures required to get on North Carolina's fall ballot as an independent for president. However, I sat down with Kennedy just before his speech, and there was confusion as to just how many signatures he actually needs. In order for you to get on the fall ballot in North Carolina as an independent presidential candidate, you need to get roughly 83,000-plus signatures um, in order to do so, correct? I, I'm not asking you. This, I, we, this is a quiz. No, 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 no. I'm not going to. I'm not going to ask you to confirm that. I, I've confirmed no, the board of elections. Is that? Yeah. You, I didn't. It's, that's it's not one and a half percent. Thirteen thousand seven hundred and fifty-seven. So that's as a party. I don't. Several hours later, his campaign acknowledged the total was just more than 83,000 and not 13,000. I know you're trying to get over 80,000 signatures on your court to, to be on the ballot. How do you feel about that? Do you think you'll make that by super? Yeah, we're going to. We, we will get all of our signatures and then some. But that may give us a signal as to why running as a libertarian candidate, which is an established party, might be easier than getting all the signatures needed in each state. This comes as a new morning consult Bloomberg poll has Trump ahead of Biden in the swing states, including North Carolina, by 13 points. Kennedy gets 9 percent of the vote. People typically tend to go to their political corners by the time of Labor Day in September and the general campaign starting. But these are worrisome signs if the president is this far behind how much effort is going to be needed in some of these states. Political scientist Michael Bitzer says Democrats only have to look at the Bush-Gore race to be nervous. If Ralph Nader, a third-party candidate then, had not been on the Florida ballot and his votes would have typically gone to Al Gore, we would not have had the 2000 uh, presidential issue uh, that Florida presented. But Kennedy told me he doesn't see himself as a spoiler. I intend to win the election. I intend to take votes away from 
President Trump and President Biden, but also what we're seeing is that a lot of my voters are people who would not have otherwise voted. Yet Bitzer says it's the basic rules of American politics. You don't necessarily win a majority. You have to win a plurality. You have to win one more vote than the person who comes in second. And then you get all of the electoral votes oftentimes in the states. And that just inherently sets up a two-party system and also designs third parties to indeed be these spoilers that I talked about. So to remind folks at home, you know, maybe scratching your head, where did Russ come up with this 83,000 yeah, yeah. State Board of Elections? It's one and a half percent of the total turnout, total voter turnout in the okay. last statewide election. That's how we get to that number. That's by state statute. That's state right. law. So does this mean he will be the Libertarian nominee? Not necessarily. The Libertarian Party will have, you know, a uh, just like the, the RNC and the DNC, exactly. they'll have their big convention, right? And they, it's up to them to nominate the, uh, the, the, who is going to be the nominee or, or vote for who will be the nominee. So no guarantees. We'll see how it plays out. Yeah, we got a lot to watch in the sure months do. ahead, folks.